Good afternoon. So I have the homework assignment graded over there. Um, you can pick it up either after the class or um, after I walk back to the office, right? Um, so how, how are things? Do you have any questions about what we covered so far? So so far we, we kind of looked at broadly what are multimedia objects, and we looked at um, some, some notions of images uh, and video, and I'd like to continue with, with the notion of audio, right? And next, we'll look into more, more compression, um, more, more in detail, rather than the um, very high level that we kind of looked at for the um, images and stuff, right? So here again, I want to give you a little bit overview of what is sound and, and what, what law allows us to get some of the compression that you really want, right? So two of, two, of, two of the things you notice here is um, the Weber's law, which I think we saw earlier, which tells us which part of the spectrum we can drop. It's essentially, if it's too loud, we can drop more. If it's too um, not loud, then we need to save more stuff because you, you can't tell the difference in, in terms of the year. The other thing we introduce here is the notion of differencing, which we use a lot in, in video, right? Rather than storing a bunch of stuff, we try to predict what the next value should be. So, um, and, and if the, if the, so you only sh store the difference, right? So the idea here is the, the, the physical phenomenon that we're looking at is continuous. Things don't change often. So rather than storing what the future value as if nothing happened, we store the difference from the current, we, we, we predict what the next value should be, and whatever differences from the predicted values is all we store, and if things don't change, we win. If things change a lot, we lose, and, and in, in sense it works, right? So sound is a, is a pressure wave. You know, sound happens when, um, unlike the, the light wave, it's a pressure wave, you know, it, it needs something to vibrate. Um, so you can think of sound, uh, um, if you think of sound as a amplitude, <coughs> This is sort of what you plot with time. You see, you have some kind, of, some kind of a wave. And the goal here is to transmit, capture this wave with a microphone or something, and then transmit it to the other end so you can play it back uh, on your speaker or what have you to get the content back, right? <clears throat> so the since you saw the waveform like that, this, this is this is probably something that if you're if you're taking any kind of double E course, this should be. Uh, I mean, you probably went way beyond what what we're covering here. But in, in the basics, um, the quality of of this process depends on the the sampling rate and the quantization uh, values, right? So the idea here is. If you have a some kind of waveform, right? When you're digitizing it, you have to send a digital signal, not analog signal. So you want to be able to say, in time, things change, and this is the amplitude value, right? So what the analog waveform says is, at this time instant, at time zero, the value was a certain thing, and time t plus one, the value was slightly higher and stuff. It's a continuous value, right? So when you want to convert it into a digital fashion, you have to say, how often you're going to do it on the x-axis? How often you're going to do it on the y-axis, right? And the x-axis is called the sampling, and the y-axis is called the quantization level, right? What that means is, since it's passing in time, let's take one second as a as a good point. We're trying to figure out how often we should uh, transmit the data, right? So the goal is you transmit the data to the other end, and they can know what what it wants. So the idea here is. If you do it once every second, so what you do is you find out the value at this time, and let's say the next time is over here, right? What this means is you sample at one hertz or once a, once a second, and you find out what this value is. And if this value happens to be A1, if this value happens to be A2, you transmit A1 at time t equals zero, A2 at time t equals one, right? And, and so on, right? So the, and, and clearly what that means is on the other end, when they, when they try to reproduce it, they, they get this data point and this data point, and they have to figure out what should go in the middle, right? Because you only have these two data, data values. So if you only send it at one, one 
hertz or one uh, sample per second, you're going to get this stuff. So you know the value was here, and you know the value was here, and somehow you have to figure out what the intermediate value should be, right? So the more closer you do, the more samples you do, the more closely it will follow what you're trying to do, right? So if you do it at uh, twice a second, and let's say you capture a value here, then you may send some value here. So on the other end, you may have fig figured out that signal looks sort of like this. The more I, more, you know, if I, if I capture it all over the place, then I can get something closer to what you want, right? So the more, so this is sort of like the, in the video, the more frames per second kind of thing. So the more I, I can sample, the better quality, the more it represents what you sent, right? The other aspect is, we can, we're not doing a digital, so we can't really send the values in whatever uh, accurate value that you want, right? So for example, this may be you know, uh, 0 0.8788 or something. Compared, you know, let's say this is one, right? This may be the accurate analog value, but when you're sending it as digital value, you have to send a, send a number, right? So that depends on the quantization level, right? So if you split this whole area into, say, zero and one as a digital form, right? You would either send either a zero, zero or a one, and, and as you can clearly see, that's gonna be a really bad idea because we're gonna be transmitting one and one and one, so on the other end, instead of the signal being here, it would have been sent as one and one and one, right? So you don't wanna send this as a bit bitmap, so you want to have higher values, right? So let's assume you have a two bit value, right? That means it can either be zero or one or two or three. So we would say this is zero and this is three because I'm having a two-bit quantization. I'm quantizing this audio into a two-bit value. That means two-bit means I have four values, right? Two-bit is four values. So I can say this, one, two, sorry. Right? That's right, right? So if I do this, then I would say this value would be, um, depending on how I round up or down, it'll be either two or three. So um, it'll be a little bit closer to what I want, right? So the higher the quantization levels, the better it represents what you want to send, right? So those are the two parameters. So the higher I, I, I quantize it, I have more values here, that means I can express it in a more finer grained value. And the more often I do that, uh, the more sampling I have, the, the sample, if the sampling rate is high, the more closely it will follow the stuff, right? So if you really want to show this particular graph, I need to have as much uh, sampling rate and as much quantization as, as possible, right? So infinity is the limit for, for both the stuff. So we're not interested in the, in the, in the infinity. We're not interested in having, you know, 64-bit quantization and um, megahertz or gigahertz worth of sampling. So what we're trying to find out is what is the minimal amount of work we can do so that you will still be happy, right? Throughout the throughout this multimedia stuff, that's the main thing we are looking at. We're not like trying to see what is the maximum, how can we produce the maximum quality ever possible? Rather, we are trying to find out what's the maximum, what's the least amount of quality I can transmit such that you can't feel the difference, right? So that's that's what we want to do. But these are the two parameters that you need to worry about, like the sampling and the quantization, right? The higher sampling gives you uh, more closer on the x-axis, higher quantization gives you more on the y-axis. Does that make sense? You may have realized it or seen this in different contexts when you buy digital audio, right? So if you buy stuff like, um, how, how many of you bought stuff, MP3s or something, either bought or downloaded from someplace? Um, so one of the parameters you, you notice when you get those uh, MP3s, right? So what are the parameters you've seen when, when people talk about um, digital audio? Bitrate. Bitrate, right? So essentially that, that boils down to this stuff, right? So people talk about bitrate, which is related to somewhat to this stuff because bitrate defines, you know, you have a certain amount of object that you collect over a, a certain duration. So if, if the number of quantization levels times the number of samples within a certain second means that you create one million bits of data, 
then your data rate would be one, one uh, million bits per second, right? So it's hard related to uh, this concept, right? Yeah, and there are, here's a number for a lot of the, the technologies that we, we, uh, we, uh, we love. So on the, or on the last column is the frequency band that this, this particular um, technique is, is trying to cover, right? So this goes into the, the, the range that a human being can hear, and that, that we, we didn't go through much into the detail of this stuff. So human beings can hear somewhere around um, 30 hertz or something, all the way to 20 hertz, I mean 20 kilohertz, um, depending on your age and other, other parameters, right? So as, as you tend to age, you, you, the, the higher end tends to fall off. You may have called it as treble and bass in, in your uh, radios and stuff. So the, the lower frequency gives you the big hum, and the higher frequency is the, the, the screechy kind of noise, right? And the, the normal voice tends to be around up to 5K. So depending on the kind of techn technology that you use, the different, uh, different stuff shows different things. So for example, if you're talking on telephone, telephone limits itself to about um, 0.2 to 3.4 kilohertz, which is in the in the voice range. So it's, the telephone is not designed for um, other other frequencies. And the way they do that is through a notion called bandpass filter. Right? So it's essentially, whenever you speak uh, on the telephone, they chop off the the frequency which is not within that range. So in this case, anything over 3.4 they can drop because that's not in in the range of normal conversations that's not being sent. So they only have to worry about this particular frequency, and we'll see how that how that affects us uh, in, in, a, in the next few slides. So beyond that, there are other parameters, right? So whether it's a stereo or, or mono, right? So stereo gives you um, st uh, localization in in in, um, in space when you hear that. The telephone is not it's not a stereo technology. So um, and. So it, it, it tells you, given these parameters of the bits per you know bits per second um, and the sample rate, how what kind of uh, data rate you would create if you don't do compression, right? So a normal telephone uses eight 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 thousand hertz, right? That means within a second it'll do eight thousand samples, and each sample is 8-bit wide, so it it's, it's goes from 0 to 255, 256 values per sample, right? And that creates about 8 kilobytes per second. And as you can see, if you go to uh, AM radio, the, the sampling rate goes up a little bit, um, and, and the data rate uh, goes up a little bit. AM radio is, is fairly close to your um, telephone. As you go to FM and, and CD and digital audio, uh, audio tapes, and and so on, it goes up, right? So the, the, the highest quality commercial stuff you can buy is the super audio CD, which is slightly higher than the DVD rate, DVD audio rate, right? So they give you enough bandwidth of about zero to 96, um, 96 kilohertz, right? So it's well beyond what normal human beings can hear, but the, the price that they pay is, the, the data rate is quite high, right? So this is sort of the the stuff that we uh, we see in, in normal practice. So CD has about you know 44.1 sample rate and 16 bits per second. Right? You might have seen this if you are trying to do any kind of audio processing. It might ask you what kind of a um, sample sampling quantization level that you want and the sampling frequency. Right? And you'll see that when you for your project when you're trying to do the video. Uh, so when you're trying to transcode the video, it'll ask you parameters about the, the video component and the audio component. And, um, and that, that's, the, that's the sampling rate. So if you're in, in EE, this, you know, Nyquist, Nyquist, Alga, Nyquist theorem and the, and the next theorem that we'll see in the next chapter, Shannon's, Shannon's law, should be ingrained into your into your conscience beyond what you want to know, right? So how many of you have doubly background, doubly or EC kind of background? Okay, so only two? Okay, so 
only two of you have W background. So for you, this must be sort of you know, Nyquist and Shannon. Um, the, the W folks I, I've seen, they love Shannon, right? Because Shannon is, um, is pretty big on communication theory. So what, what the, the Nyquist theorem is very important because it, it establishes some parameters of how much you have to do to get something done, right? So it says basically that if you have a certain frequency that you want to be sampling, so if you, if you have a certain wave waveform, right? It gives you a um, lower bound of how much sampling you have to do to make it make it good, right? So theoretically, they can prove that if you have a certain frequency, right, so if you assume that this frequency can be zero to 10 kilohertz or something, so they say for if you have this kind of frequency, the your sampling rate should be twice as much as whatever the frequency is, right? More accurately, since you're, we can talk about a band limited stuff, right? So if you're talking about zero to 10 kilohertz, which is what uh, a human ear can hear, right? Then that means you have to sample it 20 kilohertz time, right? On the other hand, if you're only covering from 5,000 to 10,000, you have to do it. Uh, you have to you have to find the the bandwidth that you're trying to sample, and you have to do it at least twice as much, right? And this is enormously important because that's what we want to do. So that gives us a bound of how much we have to do to make it make it work, right? Intuitively, it sort of makes sense, right? So this this means that if you think of this as a pure wave and not as this complex wave we I kind of pointed out, pure wave would be a sine wave, right? So this means let's say, let's say this um, this happens to be one second, right? This means it's a one hertz wave. It's it's happening um, one one cycle per second, right? So that's that's the notion of a one hertz. So you have to at least sample it um, twice, right? Because otherwise you'll end up sampling here and here, and it it look like it's it's uh, you don't you don't get the middle, right? The, the the theory and the proof is way beyond the scope of what we're trying to do. But the important part is. This is the basis for what we're trying to do. So th this says that you can sample however much you want. You can sample it every microsecond or picosecond that you want, but you at least have to have this rate to make it uh, acceptable, right? So that so that so that is that is incorporated into this. Um, so if you go back to here, right? Given this frequency band, right? This this the 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 bandwidth that you're trying to look at, right? For practical purposes, you can, you can ignore the, the, the lower component because it's close to zero, right? So this means that if you want to do 20 kilohertz, you have to do at least 40 kilohertz, or 40,000 40, times, right? Kilohertz and uh, kilohertz is, that means samples per second, right? So this means that you have to at least do 40 kilohertz worth of sampling. That means this one is doing 48, which is more than what is necessary. But at the least, you cannot go below um, 40, right? And, and so on and so forth, everything. So if it is 96, right? So if you, for whatever reason, if you want to have 96 uh, kilohertz, then your, um, your sampling has to be at least 192, right? It's max because we cannot really hear at that frequency. So, um, even if you lose something, you, you may not be able to hear the stuff, but that's the best commercial stuff you can buy, right? So that's very important, especially for the W folks, because that, that, that lets, lets them design stuff like telephones and all those things, because telephones, they can say that, you know, so given that they have a certain band, band pass filter, they can tell that you only need eight kilohertz. That means they can, you can build telephone systems because you, you, you need to be able to transmit uh, Eight kilobytes per second worth of uncompressed data, so that that so the um, that makes all our systems easy to build, right? Because because otherwise we don't know how, how how low we can go. Because we know the more we go, the better it is, right? So we'll attack that problem separately. But this is saying what, what is the least amount that you need, right? Does that make sense? So there are other metrics that we will use throughout this the the the, the chapter. The, that's the notion of finding out how acceptable whatever you're doing is relative to the original, right? And one of the metrics that we'll use is the signal to noise ratio. 
But in general, the problem is to trying to figure out for all the stuff I've talked about, I basically say it's acceptable. You have to do a certain amount to make it good and everything, right? But we need a way to measure how, what you have done. So we are, we are essentially doing lossy kind of stuff, right? So we're essentially making sure that we're not going to do as faithful a reproduction as possible. We are trying to make it as good as possible where you don't notice it being annoying, right? So we want to make sure that, suppose we have the original object here, and I changed it into this smaller object, some compressed or something I've done, right? I want to find out whether what I've done is acceptable, right? So what I want to do is, if this is the original, and this is object one, and this is object two, right? I want to find out, let's say this is um, slightly bigger, right? I want to find out what is it that I have done, right? Because if I don't have a metric of what is it I have done, I could make it into something extremely small, right? Extremely small object, which from my perspective is very good because it's so small, I can transmit it very, very good, but this may not be acceptable to you in terms of what I'm trying to convince, right? So I, I, I need to make sure that if it's audio object, the sound is good enough quality, the sound is whatever, right? And it turns out, it's a, it's a very hard problem to attack, right? Being able to compare two objects and being able to say whether one is bigger than the other, right? Being able to say which one of them is better than the other is enormously hard because we have to add the notion of all the things we talked about, right? So it's unfair. So if it turns out that this particular object is perfectly fine for a human being to hear, because that's all the information there is and you're able to find, right? So it's perfect, it's, it's, but if you look at the object, if you look at them as a bit by bit, it's likely that this and this are more closer to the, each other than it is to this one, right? So that's, that's one of the things that they, they endlessly go through because they want to get capture the subjective human user's notion of what is acceptable, right? So what I really want to do is play this original to you and play this original to you and, I mean, play this object, this object, and this object and ask you to find out which one you like, right? And it gets even harder because there, there are other things that people find which makes these things um, may, make you like or not, right? For example, if you, I mean, I'm just, I'm just making this example up, but if, if the sound that I'm showing to you is scary to you or, or brings up aspects that, um, something from your past which you scare, you may tend to like another one, right? So, so for a given, so it also depends on the content of what you're trying to show, right? So for example, if you hate a certain genre of music, right? So if I play a certain particular sound genre at a certain volume, right? You may not like it as much as the another genre that you like because the the there's the a thing involved, right? So this is pretty complicated, involves psychology and all those things, and that's some of the things that real systems have to do because you know that's one of the reasons why people may, for example, prefer iPod over something else, right? So so th there's a lot of stuff going on. But from our perspective, one easy way to measure this is something like the signal to noise ratio, which is used a lot because it captures something that is easy to calculate, because it doesn't involve any human beings and stuff. But you have to be aware that the limitations of what they're trying to do, right? So they're trying to find out what's, what's the, the ratio of the signal to noise. And the noise here is the difference, right? It's the difference between this and this. So they can take the original object and the one that you converted or compressed into another object. They're trying to find out what the difference is. And then they express it using signal to noise ratio, which is a very popular way of specifying how, how bad, uh, uh, uh. so then you can say the signal to noise ratio of this is X, this is Y. Then I can compare X and Y and say something about what is better, what is, what is good, right? So the, the matrix here is the signal to noise ratio, but be aware that signal to noise ratio only gets you so far because it, it, it completely ignores everything about all the stuff we talked about, right? But that's the nature of, of how the metric is. It's easy to calculate, so it's popular, but it's not, it need not be accurate. Um, so it's, it's expressed in decibel, which is essentially a log scale. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's, the, um, that's the definition of it. Um, and again, if you're folks in the doubly, uh, doubly uh, think of 
decibels a lot easier than folks in computer science. It's a logarithmic scale, which means that a decibel of 40 and a decibel of 50, one is 10, time, 10 times more than the other one, right? So I think I have a... So this is the common, so if you, you know, decibels uh, levels of, of the different sounds um, uh, uh, as, a, as a thing. So threshold of hearing is it's, um, uh, it's considered to be zero, and the other other concepts are, are louder. So um, you know, rustle of leaves is a, a decibel of ten, and um, so loud radio is a decibel of eighty, right? So in terms of this, so from from 10 to 20, it's 10 times larger, right? Because it's in log scale, log, log 10 scale. So from um, rustle of leaves to an average room, it's 100 times louder, right? And a rustle of leaves to a conversation is um, what, 10,000, right? Um, that that much louder. So, so that's is 10 power 5 louder, right? And so on and so forth, right? So the so this express in in, um, in in decibel for for the different stuff. So when we talk about signal to noise ratio, it, it basically tells you what the what the what the noise added by the particular trans, uh, particular transformation is, right? Make sense? There's another metric that we use to make sure to understand the, the quantization uh, errors, right? That's the that's notion of a SQNR, which basically figures out what's the what is the noise introduced by in terms of quantization, right? The idea here is if you use an eight-bit coder, right? Inherently, whatever you do, you're going to add a noise, right? What that means is, suppose the input goes from zero to one in real real numbers, right? Since you're sending only eight bit, it means that you're only doing 256 levels, right? That means you can only resolve up to 256 levels, right? So quantization level is basically a fundamental limit of what you're trying to send. So for this particular bit, if you're sending it at eight bit, then you're only able to express this this infinite uh, real numbers as two to six values. So, so that gives indication of how noisy your output would be, regardless of what else you do. Even if you sample it every picosecond, you just cannot avoid the fact that you're not able to solve more than uh, one in 256, and that's the indication of the, uh, that's called the um, SQNR, right? So now we'll we'll look into some of the ways that you can do this this quantization, right? So I, I talked about you, you need to do this quantization at certain level. Um, so the simple way is like what I kind of pointed out here, which is I have two to six values, so I can I can take it every so often and equally separate it, and I can capture the the amplitude at at, at any one instance, and that's called the linear, linear format. I mean it's quantization a linear format. Right, and we don't do that because turns out, at least for the hearing component, our ear follows the the Weber's law. Right, Weber's law is comes from psych, uh, physiology, uh, I think, um, which basically says that you you perceive differences as the ratio. Right, so if you, for example, if you have a, uh, some kind of a So suppose something was 10, right? Another quantity was one, right? So if this went from 10 to 20, right? And if this goes from one to two, they'll both appear the same, feel, you, you feel them as the same uh, to you, right? Um, right, because it basically this one, so you only capture the, 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 the ratio difference, not the actual magnitude, right? So if you looked at the, the the sound chart on the previous previous stuff, right? Compared to the the quiet room, um, your conversation is hundred thousand hundred thousand times larger, right? But it doesn't sound hundred thousand times larger to you because you only perceive the the ratio difference, not the absolute values, right? And so uh, otherwise, um, you you would be 
if you did it in a linear fashion, then a quiet room would be zero, and, uh, and a connotation like this would, would be, um, what? Actually, a million, right? 10 power 6 is a million, right? It's a million times louder than the other one, and we don't perceive it like that because you only look at the difference, right? So, so we use that fact here. So what that means is you only notice the differences. So I don't have to do it all in, in, um, in linear fashion because you, don't, you only notice large differences, right? So if something is large, I don't have to store as much of it because turns out if something is large, right? So if this quantity went from 10 to 12, right? You would notice far less of it than if it went from one to three, right? This will look to you like it, it, it was, um, it went up twi twice as much, whereas 10 to 12, you would hardly perceive the difference because the ratio, the ratio is small. In absolute terms, it, it changed a lot, right? So we use that in the, in the sound form. So what we do is we take the amplitude, the, the sound signal that you have, transform it into a theoretical space they call R space. Right? So transform it into that space. In that space, sort of like what we did with the, with the JPEG images, uh, in terms of taking the, from the spatial domain to the frequency domain, you do this transformation. So in that domain, you, you know where the loud, loud components are and you know where the quiet components are. Then you can do nonlinear, basically saying anything which is on the quiet component, I want to use more more of it. Anything which is a loud, loud value, I want to use less of it. The way I do more of it is I assign more quantization to it. Right? So, so in effect, what I'm trying to do is let's assume that we're looking at sound. Right? I'm going to say, let's say 0 to 0 0.5, and let's, I'm, I'm kind of splitting into some kind of a scale. I'm kind of defining this to be quiet and this to be quite loud. Then I'm going to quantize a lot more here and then I'm going to quantize less here, right? If I can find a transformation which lets me take this sound into a format where I can separate the stuff like this, then since I know that quiet stuff, you can hear a lot more than loud stuff, I can use different quantization for this stuff. So for even the same thing, so even if you think of 8-bit stuff, so even the 8-bit, um, eight, eight which will give me 256 values, I assign more to the part where you can hear more, and I assign less, assign less to the part where you cannot hear more, right? So if I can do that, then for a given quantization level, I can get output which to you sounds the same because loud stuff, there's not much difference. I'm not transmitting much of the loud, loud components. I'm transmitting much of the, the nuances, and your ear, you cannot perceive the difference. So it looks the same, but so in effect, it looks like I'm quantizing at this level, right? Which let's say is twice or something. So I'm, I'm, I'm look like I'm quantizing more, but I, I didn't really quantize that much, right? So why would I care about the quantization? So why can't I just use more bits? Yeah? Because you're already limited in bandwidth. How much data you can send. If you're gonna download something on the internet, you don't want to yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent point. Right. So essentially, the, that's the whole thing, right? Uh, you, you have to remember that. So our goal is not to send as much as possible, right? That's very, very easy to do in this system, right? Um, the the whole multimedia concept. If you want to send the best quality, it's trivial. We won't be in the class to study that because you know um, I, I I can quantize it at at million points. I can quantize it at 64 uh, bits and stuff, and I can transmit it. The goal here is to send as little as possible to give you the, still the best effect, right? So given within an 8-bit, which, which has significance in how much data I have to send, so if I can choose 8-bit and still make it look like 16-bit by essentially assigning more to the, 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 the quiet concept and, and less to the loud, loud component, I win because then to you it, it looks, it sounds good enough and, and we are good, right? This is, you may have sort of heard this argument if you followed the discussion with like Apple and all those things, right? If you looked at the, um, the, the CD, right? The CDs have a lot more data than what you have on your MP3s and stuff, right? How many of you notice the difference between a CD and an MP3 um, objects that you 
may have purchased you must have noticed it how many of you didn't notice the difference they look sound the same okay so I was afraid that nobody's gonna uh, right um, so I'm surprised that nobody noticed the difference right you, you should have been able to notice it under the right circumstances, but for the no normal stuff, you don't notice, right? Do you know what kind of a bitrate you listen to in your typical um, MP3 or MP4 objects? How many of you ripped your own songs? But what, what software tool you use? Uh, I use Windows Media Player. Windows Media Player. Um, is that what you guys used to? So if you gone into some advanced mode, right, it'll ask you what some of the stuff, right? What's the, what is the bit rate that you want and um, what is output rate you want and stuff, right? Um, what do you choose? Like some number that you remember? Is uh, 256. 256? Uh, yeah. Um, is that what you guys choose to? 256 for the for practical purposes will will sound as good as the CD, right? But the CD is a lot higher. I, mean, I think the CD rate, if you look at the, it's a different compression algorithm, but the rate is more like one megabits per second kind of stuff, right? Um, and partly because of the different compression, you know, one looks um, better than the uh, other one. Um, but we, we do think about this all the time, and that's the reason why um, whoever you know, who is selling this stuff to you is able to say you can get a one, you know, 128 um, um, uh, bits, um, 100 kbps uh, MP, MP, MP3 objects that they sell at um, iTunes and stuff, they can sell it to you because you know, clearly compared to the, the CD, they're far inferior. But for most practical purposes, they're okay because they can, they can they play all, all this kind of a tricks. And, and we'll, uh, we'll see more tricks as we go to the next, next slides, right? So at this point, what we're trying to do is, we are trying to say, for a given technology, I'm going to restrict myself to a certain frequency, right? Um, and the frequency, again, depends on, so if you're on the telephone and stuff, you don't really complain because you're, you're supposed to use it for voice and stuff. Within the CD and stuff, it depends on what your hearing can, your ears can hear and what your speaker can play, right? Uh, most of you are far younger than me, so you probably can hear more than uh, what I can hear at you see, you go to this web pages which tells you how much you can hear. I think I, think I can hear up to 16K or something. So I can't really hear anything beyond that. So in that sense, I don't really have to store any of those stuff, right? And so we kind of define what frequency we want to hear for a given technology. And then uh, Nyquist tells us how much I have to sample, right? So I can go a little bit over that, but I don't have to go really far from that. So if I, if I can only hear from 16,000, so I may have to hear it up to... 32,000, I mean, at least I need 32K uh, of, of sampling, right? But there's no reason for me to sample at 192 or something because I, I don't really, um, but, I, but I don't have to go below, I mean, I cannot go below that, right? And then if I use this nonlinear quantization stuff, then I can use a certain number of bit, bit rates. I can use 16 bits, but make it look like I'm actually doing 32 bit or something because I'm, I'm allocating more bits to areas that I can hear and less to areas that I cannot hear. Um, as long as I can do this transformation from this form to other form. And the one of the, so the, the space is called uh, R space, um, and they use an encoding called mu law or u law encoding, which essentially does this stuff, which essentially trans transforms it. Um, so this is the graph they have. So they, they take your frequency, your amplitude, use uh, apply this transformation, essentially modifies into this, this particular curve. Um, and anything closer to here is the, is the quiet ones. Anything over, over at the ends are the loud ones, right? So if you go, so essentially the, the idea is you look at the response on the, the y-axis. So if you go from here to here, you you notice sort of this much difference. Whereas if you go from here to here, you only notice that little difference, right? If you look at the y-axis, right? So you allocate more bits to stuff here and less bits to stuff here. Um, and since you use the Weber law, and since we do this transformation, um, 
we can we can get better more uh, we can make it look more than better than it looks. Yeah. Uh, the x axis is an S L S P. What is that? Um, I forget what the SLSP was, but the intuition was the is the is the sound um, power, right? This is this is quiet, and this is loud. Um, I forget what it is. It's in it's in a textbook, right? So essentially, this is the louder part, and this is the uh, quieter part, and the y-axis is the um, your, your response, right? And they also always have a positive and a negative component because of the pressure wave stuff, right? Um, so the, another important uh, thing that you look at it from a computer perspective is, I can do this sampling and stuff, which, which basically means that I'm trying to look at some uh, some um, video which is um, which is which is actually created by some other means, right? But if you're using a computer to get, generate these programs, right? So, so, it, so the way to create noise in in, in computers is is to, to through like three popular mechanisms, right? One is the frequency modulation, where you can specify the the uh, the the frequency. So, this a, a complex waveform like audio waveform like this is essentially a addition of a lot of simple sine waves, right? So, if I know all the sine waves which make up so if I want to create this particular uh, line, right, I can find out all the sine waves which, if you add them, would cause this stuff. So essentially with the idea of frequency modulation is I create, I find out all the frequencies and then transmit, and then I set, t tell that to the transmitter. So it'll, cre it'll add all the, all the uh, frequencies. Essentially this is what your FM radio does to get you the signal you want, right? So I can describe any sound that I want within a computer using this frequency modulation stuff, um, and the it's it's of limited use because the it's harder to make this variation uh, programmatically as much as uh, you want. So the other other way to do that is through wavetable, right? Wavetable is you 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 actually capture real instruments, real something, and put it into the sound card, right? So you basically say I want to send, I want to transmit this stuff. What that is is this is instrument one, this is instrument two, instrument three. I want you to play instrument one from this time to this time with a certain volume, and then this instrument is another instrument kind of thing. And together they give you the sound that you want, right? Since I have the real sound, real sample sound inside, it looks far more realistic to you than me synthetically creating all the stuff, right? So the wave, wave, wave is the is the popular. Um, Sound form that you use in, in PCs and stuff to make make uh, sounds. The challenge here is, if I want to make it as realistic as possible, I need to have as many instruments as possible. And these instruments have to be in the ones which are generating the stuff. Most of the time, it's a sound card. So your sound card has to have lots of instruments. If it has lots of instruments, then it can create the the most richer kind of uh, um, music. And that depends on how much memory you have on the sound card, right? As technology moves forward, we have enough memory to add enough uh, enough uh, music uh, table into the into the cards, so we we get fairly uh, good audio, computer generated audio you know, in terms of beeps and all those things. So essentially, you 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 have a standard set of instruments, up downloaded to the card or built into the card. So if you want to create a sound. You split them into the different instruments which make this stuff, and then you instruct the the, the card to play it uh, using the particular instrument, which is already generated, which is already captured into the card, right? And the and the last one is the is the MIDI is a scripting language. It lets you like you, you might have seen you know playing uh, your computer um, digital keyboard you know play piano kind of thing. So essentially, whenever you press a key, you want to be able to communicate that with the with the computer. And the language that you use is the MIDI, right? So if you're composing digital digital audio, essentially when you press a key, the MIDI language will tell you what you pressed, and the computer can then decide what instrument to play, and then find the right table with the right um, music stuff to make it sound good, right? 
So the difference here is these are all being generated by the card. There is no physical equivalence for it. So you don't really talk about bit, bit rates and all those things because, like for example, for the wave table, you have the actual RDO sampled and built into the system. So it can be as good quality as what you've already stored on the card, right? So in terms of the process of, of how we, how this whole process works, right? So we, when you, your uh, audio system of audio uh, subcomponent essentially takes analog audio form, right? It does this band filtering, which is a process where it decides what frequency it has to keep and what frequency it can, it can drop. And then typically it does this, you know, the, the, the transformation to the R space. So you can do nonlinear modulation, right? And the simple form to do the modulation is the, the PCM or the pulse code modulation, which, which, which quantizes it based on the particular MULA that you used, you know, giving more for uh, silent ones and, and, and less for loud ones. And then you send it to the other end. You convert it into the digital to analog. Right? So this is from here, it'll be a digital format. Then you send it to the other end. And then you, re you, you repeat, the, you uh, uh, reverse the process, right? You do the MULA to the, um, the sound mo model, send it to a low pass filter, and then and, uh, output the signal, right? Um, so instead of sending the PCM, PCM basically means that you, you create, you, you do the, the signal. So let's say, in that model, you create the output happens to be 80, 75, 20, 80, right? Which means that within the time frame, within certain, let's say one second, I did four samples, right? And at one time it was 80, another time it was the value was 75, and all those things which are being transmitted. More, uh, more complex way of sending those is to do um, differencing, right? Where I can, I can figure out that I can send 80, and then I can send five. Um, I, can, I can only do the diff from the previous one. So if things don't change, if I do a send a differential coding, then you will see less stuff, right? So if, 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 um, if it turns out that US, the output was like 75 kind of thing, then if I'm doing a differential, then I can only send 80, 75, and then I don't have to send anything. I'll send some indication to say, repeat whatever you had, right? So that's the notion of a differential stuff where the assumption here is things that the, even, even though I'm doing eight, you know, 40,000 signals per uh, second, there's not that many variations because, you know, turns out that there's not that, that many variations. So I can, I can get better compression using DM, right? Um, ADPCM is, is more complex. It's, it's, it's sort of what you see on the MPEG-4 and stuff. We'll, we'll get back to them uh, later in the, in the section. Essentially, at this point, we are doing the predict, predictive stuff, right? So the, 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 the intuition is if I know, if I see a pattern here, right, if I see like 80, 75, 75, 80, let's say 75, 75, right? If I, if I can somehow predict this is happening, then all I have to send is send you the pattern, right? And then let tell you how you would run the algorithm on the other end to predict what the output should be. Then I only send you what would have changed, right? Let's let's say for example, the output happens to be 80, 75, 80, 75, 76, 80, right? The intuition here is I can say the predictor would say, you know, 80, 75, 80, 75, 80, 75 is what you you're going to see. So I would have to send you 80, 75, some way of selling you what the predictor was, right? So on the other end, you, you can basically recreate 80, and you'll create 75. So all I have to say is 0 um, plus 1, right? That's intuition. We'll, we'll get, get back more to this we'll, when you go to video and stuff. But essentially here, the idea is things don't change all that much. So if I can predict what the output should be, all I have to tell you is, um, do do the stuff. So I only tell you what the differences is, right? I lose if I cannot predict, but I gain if you can predict. So the ADPCM stuff um, is pretty complicated to for you to create because it has to know what is the what is the prediction model, right? Uh, and if the prediction was always wrong, then you actually end up worse than when you started. So it has to fall back to the other model. So most of your newer codecs use uh, ADPCM and get 
at very good quality. But we'll get back to this concept uh, later in the semester too. And I'm sort of, I'll see you on Wednesday.